Hello, and welcome to another episode of Change of Raiment. Can you believe we're already at episode five? It's moving very fast. How many of you enjoyed last week's interview with Sister Keisha? I know I certainly did. Now, how many of you went out and purchased a sewing machine to begin your journey of sewing for God's glory? All right, well, I have news for you. We have other interviews and other testimonies that you will hear from other individuals that are walking with the Lord within the process of dress reform. So we will have them on as this series continues. But tonight, as you have already seen from the title, we are going to be dealing with who wears the pants, God's order reversed and Satan's counterfeit dress reform movement. So if you don't know by now, by the title, we are dealing with cross dressing. That's right. Women dressing like men, men dressing like women. And unfortunately, it has become very commonplace in this day and age. So we would like to begin with a statement here that will set the tone for the rest of the study. It says here on the screen, our words, our actions and our dress are daily living preachers gathering with Christ or scattering abroad. This is no trivial matter. Now, I don't want to just quickly run past this statement. It's just two simple, short sentences, but yet it is loaded. It is pregnant with meaning. It says our words, our action, and our dress are daily living preachers. So that means we are preaching a sermon by our words, obviously, by our actions, and by our dress. So the question we must ask ourselves, what sermon am I preaching by the way I am dressed today? What sermon did you preach this past Sabbath by how you were dressed? Was your dress gathering with Christ or was your dress scattering away from Christ? You know, that principle is found in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, that says, he that is not with me is against me. And he that does not gather with me is scattering abroad. So our dress is doing one of two things. It is either gathering to Christ, gathering souls to Christ, or it's scattering souls away from Christ. And then the last sentence says, this is no trivial matter. So this is not a matter that we are to take lightly. Our dress is something that we need to duly consider, something that we need to take to God in prayer, something that we need to study. It is no trivial matter. It is not inconsequential, inconsequential, right? So we want to go back to the beginning. Again, we're talking about dressing for God's glory. We're talking about cross-dressing, but let's lay the foundation in the very beginning. Now, in our first two lessons, we dealt extensively with Adam and Eve. So we're going to briefly revisit that so we can build on that concept. So of course, we know Adam and Eve were created in God's image. God was, is clothed with glory, as we found out from Psalm 104. So Adam and Eve, before sin, they were covered with God's glory, right? They were covered. But then when they sinned, they lost that covering of light. And as a result, they were naked. What did Adam and Eve do in Genesis chapter three, verse seven? The Bible tells us that they were naked and they were ashamed. And so they took fig leaves and what did they make? They made aprons out of those fig leaves. And we discovered that those fig leaf apron garments did not cover Adam and Eve's sin. It did not cover their nakedness. They were still destitute. They were still naked in God's sight. Now, before God gave them coats of skin, something very interesting happened, right? In Genesis chapter three, and you can read it from verses 16 through 19, God gave a distinction in Adam's roles and Eve's roles. He made a distinction in their roles, okay? So he said, Eve, as a result of you all sinning, now your desire shall be toward your husband, right? He shall rule over thee. And also that she would experience sorrow in childbirth. That was a part of uh, her role now. Now, what was Adam's role? Adam's role was, well, the ground was cursed because of Adam's sin. And it said it was going to bear thorns and thistles. And by the sweat of his brow, Adam would eat. So Adam now would have to struggle. He would have to suffer. He would have to work very hard to provide for his family. So we see a distinction in Adam and Eve's roles. Two verses later now in Genesis 3, chapter 21, that's where we find God covering Adam and Eve with what? Covering them with coats of skin. 
Now, because God gave them a distinction in their roles, their respective roles, Adam would be the head, right? Eve would be submissive to Adam, her husband. Adam would provide for his wife. God also, we can infer here that God also gave a distinction in their dress. So although they were both clothed in robes, there was a particular robe for Adam as a man, and there was a particular robe for Eve as a woman. Now, can we deduce that perhaps when Adam and Eve made these fig leaf garments, that they made a unisex garment, that there was no distinction in their aprons? The Bible does not say that there was any difference in the apron that Eve was wearing and the apron that Adam was wearing. All we know that the apron was not only immodest, but it was also unhealthful. It was not healthful for their bodies. And so we can deduce again that they were dressing alike. So when God differentiated their roles, he also made a distinction in dress. Now, how do we know this? Because God, God, God's practices and his words do not contradict each other, right? So in Deuteronomy 22, verse five, we find the principle that says the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto the man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. All that do so are what? An abomination unto God. Now, can you imagine that? There are many of us as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, many unknowingly, many, not everyone is outright in rebellion, that are an abomination to God just based on the fact that they are wearing that which pertaineth unto the man, right? So let me go back to that first quotation where it says that our dress is a daily living preacher, right? So what sermon did Adam and Eve preach when they put on those fig leaf, fig leaf garments? They were preaching a sermon. Yes, they were rebelling against God. Were they trying to cover their sins? They absolutely were. They were trying to hide their sins. And we know what we're told in Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, right? But praise God that he offered them a change of raiment. We can also go to Job chapter 31, verses 33 and 34, which says that Adam and Eve, that Adam, it says, if I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom, so he was attempting to hide and cover his iniquity. But can we hide from God? No, he knows everything and he sees everything. So we're going to be dealing with this. We are going to be dealing with cross dressing and how many of us unknowingly, as I said, and some of us knowingly are violating this principle. And thus our dress is abominable in God's sight. But we want to find out and what God has in store for us as it relates to a change of raiment. So we're gonna go on to these next two statements here. It says here, I saw that God's order has been reversed and his special directions disregarded by those who adopt the American costume. We're gonna delve into that a little later in our study. What is the American costume? I was referred to Deuteronomy 22 verse five, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. God would not have his people adopt the so-called reform dress. That's Satan's counterfeit of God's dress reform. It is immodest apparel, holy. That means entirely unfitted for the modest, humble followers of Christ. So God's order has been reversed. Now you think about it. This statement was written in the 1800s, right? We're in 2023. Do we see how God's order has been reversed and is being reversed? We see it. Every day we see it. We see individuals stating that a man can marry a man. A woman can marry a woman. What was God's order that he established in the beginning in Eden that still holds true today? His order was that marriage were to, was to be between one man and one woman, but that is being reversed, right? Society has changed. And a lot of people say, oh, because society changes, we must keep up and we must adapt with the ever-changing society. So we have to accept it. Is that what the word of God teaches? No. When culture and society contradicts the word of God, we reject it. Because guess what? 
God's word does not change. Now, for those that would say, oh, this was only written for the 1800s or these councils were, were just for back then, it doesn't apply to us. I would say to you that the Bible is very clear that the prophets in the Bible, they wrote more for the last days, more for our time than they wrote even for the times in which they lived. And we can find that in 1 Peter 1, I believe verse 10 through 12. We can find that in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, and we can find it in Romans chapter 15 that these counsels, God does not change, right? Not one jot or one tittle of his word shall pass away. So let's go to this next statement here. And also, let me say something else about God's order being reversed. We not only see it in terms of the marriage, but we see it also in terms of people wanting to reverse the sex that they were born with. You were born as a, a boy, born as a male, but now you want to reverse and you want to take hormones and mutilate yourself to become a female and vice versa. That's God's order being reversed. And that's something that is very prevalent, very common today. So let's look at this second statement here. And this one also comes from the second paragraph of volume one. It says, there is an increasing tendency to have women in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible. Is that true? And to fashion their dress very much like that of men. But God pronounces it abomination. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. You know, if you look up that word pertaineth that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. That means belongeth. Pertaineth means belongeth. It means in relation to. It means resembling. So if we were to interpose that definition into the text, it would say the woman shall not wear that which belongeth unto a man. It would say the woman shall not wear that which is in relation to a man's garment. Right. The woman shall not wear that which resembles a man's garment. And the opposite is true. Vice versa. Is that right? OK. So now it said that there's an increasing tendency an increasing tendency to have women in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this American costume because the American costume is mentioned here in the first paragraph, paragraph one of volume uh, one, page 457. And the American costume was basically born out of the 19th century feminist movement where women were rebelling and protesting against what they deemed as patriarchal oppression. So no longer do we want to fulfill the traditional role of the wife and the mother, the stay-at-home person that manages the home. No, now we want to clamor for our rights. We want to go out and work and do the role that men are supposed to do, biblically, right? We want to be the breadwinners, okay? We want to go out and we want to make the money, and we don't want to have anything to do with cooking or managing the household, making our clothes, taking care of our children. We can do the work too. That's where this American costume uh, was born out of the 19th century. And we see where it is progressed to today. And now as a result of women trying to fulfill a role that God did not call them to fulfill, they are thus leaving vacant the role that God has designed for them. And that is not uh, God's order. That's God's order being reversed. They are not trying to fulfill the role that God has given them to do. So who's going to take on that role then? Who's going to raise the children, right? And then therefore children are left to raise themselves and then the cycle just perpetuates itself and things get worse and worse. Hence, we're in the mess we're in today where boys don't know if they're a boy or a girl. <laughs> People want to say they can change their sex, their gender. It's just confusion. So I won't go into much of the history of the American costume, but I want to refer you to this wonderful, wonderful book. Now, this is a book I should have referred to you at the very beginning of our series. This is called Thy Nakedness, written by Gwen and Rick Shorter. This book has been very instrumental in my life. And this is the newest edition. And I just want to thank Sister Gwen Shorter. She actually sent us a personal copy of, of the new, latest edition. It was first published in 1993, but this is the newest, the fourth edition, I believe. This book, along with volume one of the testimonies, the Bible, of course, and personal Bible study with my husband <laughs> and prayer and God's leading, this book 
was really what solidified my um, journey with dress reform and really put all the pieces together. And this is a book that I still draw much um, <laughs> knowledge from as well. And even in putting together this study, a lot of the um, principles I you know, have taken from this book, because this book is based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So please, you can read up on the American costume so you can know all of the history of it. I can't take the time to do it here in this study. We have other things to get to. And another website I want to recommend to you is called sistersinskirts.com. They also go into the history of the American costume and have excellent PowerPoint presentations and information on dress reform. So I'm just throwing that plug in right there. Get your copy of Thy Nakedness, beautiful book, and go to that website as well as you continue on your journey in dress reform. All right, so we are going to look at the next statement. And we're going to talk about Satan's counterfeit. Because do you realize that for everything God does, Satan has a counterfeit for? We can list off <laughs> multitudinous things that Satan has a counterfeit for. He has, God has a Sabbath. Satan has a counterfeit Sabbath, right? God has a, a Bible, right? The King James Version. Satan has all kind of different counterfeit Bibles, right? God has right? His order. Satan has his order. God has dress reform and Satan has a counterfeit dress reform movement and has the audacity to even call it the dress reform movement. But it's not really dress reform. It's dress deform because the dress degenerated from uh, being immodest and unhealthful to be being even more immodest and unhealthful. And now it uh, brought in the cross-dressing. So the statement says here that those who feel called out to join the movement in favor of women's rights and the so-called, you see how she calls it the so-called, so this is the counterfeit, the so-called dress reform might as well sever all connection with the third angel's message. Now that's serious. So those who feel like they were to join this women's rights, women's liberation, women rebelling against the roles that God ordained for them in Genesis 3 and all throughout the Bible, the roles that God gave them as women, you might as well not even call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist because it's the three angels' message, messages that make us Seventh-day Adventists, that have cut us out from the world, right? That has cut us out from Babylon. Sever your connection if you are feel called to join this movement. It says the spirit which attends the one cannot be in harmony with the other. The scriptures are plain upon the relations and rights of men and women. Let them adopt this costume and look what happens. Their influence is dead. The people would place them on a level with spiritualists and would refuse to listen to them. So let's talk about what this so-called dress reform movement was. Let's talk about this American costume. What exactly is the American costume? One thing we know, the spirit of prophecy says it's immodest. Another thing, she says it is God's order being reversed? And another thing, it is women trying to dress like men. So the American costume is basically consisted of a woman wearing a long jacket, wearing slacks, wearing pants, right? The title is Who Wears the Pants? Wearing pants, men's boots, and it often came with a cap. So her dress was very, very much like a man, okay? So I think we have some pictures here and we are going to look at them on the screen. This is what, these are some of the adaptations of the American costume. This was a part of Satan's counterfeit dress reform movement. So you see a short, tiny little dress with oftentimes there, there would be a vest with it. Um, there would often be men's boots with it. There were different adaptations to it, but that in essence is what it is. It's the pants. And Sister White says that it is immodest and it is unfit for the people of God to dress in this manner. This is dressing like a man. This is in violation of Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse five. So what would the Lord say today? Has this uh, costume, do we see people dressing like this today? Do we see women dressing like this today? No, well, what has happened? If it were possible for this style of dress to de- <laughs> To get any worse, let's put it that way, right? It has, because why? The dress has been taken away and you're left with just the trousers and the shirt. So it's even worse, right? So 
let's um, go about go back to this statement here in volume one. It says here that God would not have his people. And that's paragraph one. I'm in the uh, top paragraph. God would not have his people adopt this so-called dress reform. It is immodest. Why is it immodest? Because the shape of the legs are showing and it's wholly unfitted for the humble followers of Christ. So now let's, I have some videos to share with you. And even the world is talking about the history of this American costume and where pants wearing came from. And this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica online, okay? And we see that the feminist movement is very, very strong and vile today. Today they are advocating for things that are totally against the word of God. Abortions, advocating for all kind of filth and LGBT mess. All right, so let's look at this. Let's look at a little bit of history of this. The dress reform movement arose in the mid 19th century with the goal of giving women the freedom to wear trousers for both practical and political purposes. Trousers were seen as a symbol of women's rights, a radical proposition at the time. All right, let's look at this. Now, you're gonna see in the next slide here that individuals that have accepted and accept now that pants wearing is a woman's garment, they would have to now take the next step in, in accepting dresses for men. This is not what I'm saying. This is what the world is saying. This is what the world is saying. So we're going to go to this next part of the video. More than a century after women's rights activists had first begun their push to reform how women dress, the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 1970s finally helped to break down the stigma against women wearing pants. Today in the U.S., the question of whether women can wear pants in public isn't a question at all, which means we're free to move on to the next frontier of gendered fashion, making it socially acceptable for men to wear dresses. Fair's fair, right? Now, let me just say this while we're transitioning to our next thing. Why is it that we are so comfortable with women wearing men's garments, wearing pants? These Nobody would argue that pants, slacks, trousers, whatever you want to call them, are men's garment. We're designed for men. But yet, because it has become so common, because it has become socially acceptable, now we don't have a problem with this. But yet, when we see men, now this is a male mannequin, if you can't tell. It's hard to tell by the way it's dressed, correct? But yet we are appalled, we are aghast when we see something like this. We recoil in horror. And you know what? We make an association that this person must be uh, cross-dressing, must think he's a woman, must be a homosexual. But yet, why is it that women that are wearing men's garment get a pass? A pass? Now, I'm not saying that all women that are doing this are doing it to be masculine. A lot of them don't know. Most of them don't know. I didn't know at the time. There was a time when I was wearing pants. But praise God that the light shone brightly that, you know, and the Lord allow me to come to the truth of dress reform because I don't want to be associated with a feminist movement. I don't want to be associated as trying to look masculine. I don't want to be associated as a lesbian. And we're going to see later in this slide that in past times, people that wore dress or wore slacks were signaling to other women that they were those ways. Right. They would send signs, secret signs to each other before it became so socially acceptable. But now because it's ubiquitous, because it's all over the place, individuals feel that this is OK. But yet this is not. Even as the video said, since society and since individuals have accepted this, the trousers and the men garment, the bow tie, etc., the whole look. As being acceptable and, and as being female garments, why not? Like they said, take the next step. Be consistent, right? Would anybody say that a, a dress was made, de designed for a man? What about the argument? Well, they have a, a specific cut of dress for the men. So there's one for the women and one for the men. Would you accept that? That this particular style is a man's style of a dress? Or would you say, no, dresses and skirts were initially designed and still are. They are a woman's garment. The same thing with slacks. Now, I don't want to be graphic here, but
But even where the zipper is on the slacks, it serves a functional purpose. Now, there will be critics that will probably say, well, it's just to get the pants to go on easier. Well, then put the zipper in the back and see how well that works out. Now, what if this person were to, all right, lengthen the arms, cover, cover, right? And maybe lengthen the skirt a little bit like so. Is that acceptable now? Now that this person is covered? No, he's still dressed in a man's garment. Are both of these mannequins covered? They're both covered. Are they dress reformers? No, they are cross-dressing. This person is in drag, but yet we look at the woman and we say, there's nothing wrong because it has become common. I don't care how much society changed. Society says now that two people of the same sex can get married. God's word doesn't endorse that, so neither do I. And just because society, I don't care if the majority of society says that we have to accept it, we have to progress, we have to evolve, whatever they want to say, we cannot accept it because God's word does not. And just because this is so common and so many of us are doing it, wearing pants, it's not acceptable. Pants were designed as a male garment. We will go back to the set and we will talk about the expression, who wears the pants? We've all heard that expression, right? Who wears the pants? Okay, where do we think that that phrase, phraseology came from? Who wears the pants, right? Before we get to who wears the pants, I want to get to Eve here. I want to talk about Eve and the feminist movement. Let's see here. We're going to put it on the screen in just a second here. The so Eve, when More she ventured after off to... When she ventured from her husband's side and when she decided to go on forbidden ground, as it were, could we infer that if she were to be placed in the 19th century, right, the 1800s, that she would have been a part of this feminist movement, that she perhaps was not content in the role that God assigned for her? Would she have adopted the American costume? Well, let's see for ourselves. Let's read this statement here on the modern Eves. Eve had been what? Perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home. But like restless modern Eves, she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her. In attempting to rise above her original position, her role, right? What happened? She fell far below it. A similar result will be reached by all who are unwilling to take up cheerfully their life duties in accordance with God's plan. In their efforts to reach positions, right? We want to be in the workforce. We want to be the breadwinner. To reach positions for which he has not fitted them, many are leaving vacant the place where they might be a blessing. In their desire for a higher sphere, many have sacrificed true womanly dignity and nobility of character and have left undone the very work that heaven appointed them. Now, why did we bring that in? We brought that in because... It just shows the connection between the connection between cross-dressing women dressing like men, right? And them leaving the roles that God assigned for them. They, it, one accompanies the other, right? Okay, let's More go to this next statement now. here. It says here, we read this one already. Okay, so let's go back here. Sorry. So now we can all attest to the fact that the majority of women of all ages, from children all the way up, they wear pants for very, they wear for every day, every day attire, right? They say it's more comfortable, it provides them more freedom, so they exercise in pants, they lounge in pants, they travel in pants, they visit in pants, they go shopping, they work in pants. But just because it's common, again, just because society accepts it, just because it's culturally accepted, Acceptable does not mean that God accepts it. Again, look at this next graphic and weep. Look at this. How do you feel? So what if we saw men doing these things? Some of these are celebrities. Some of you may have seen some of these individuals before, right? We, again, we recoil. It's repulsive. It's repugnant to us. We, they must be gay, right? When we see them dressed this way. But what if this becomes common? 
What if, what if we start seeing men dressing like this on the street? Does that make it okay? No. So why is there a double standard when it comes to women dressing like men? Again, it's a serious thing and it's something that we need to take to God in prayer because when I first learned this part of the dress reform movement, it wasn't easy for me. It wasn't. I, I was into sports, heavily into sports, um, exercising, something I love to do. I still love to do it. It was very hard for me, but I would rather please God than please myself. And I started one by one and praise God for my husband at the time, you know, at the time we weren't husband and wife, but he was able to help me start that process and bought me a few little skirts. And you know what? I wore those skirts. And I would just change them out. Maybe I had two or three and I would wear one one day, the next day, wear another one, and then it would just be a cycle until I could get more. My parents were also very instrumental in this journey for me, buying me skirts, and eventually I was able to accumulate more. So God does provide. He works with us where we are, right? We have to have a starting place. And I want to say a lot of um, women wearing pants like this, it, it's really a fairly recent phenomenon. You can ask your parents, grandparents, even your great grandparents. And I'm thinking back to my grandparents, my grandmothers, both of them, my maternal and paternal. I cannot think of one time, one instance where I've seen either one of them in pants. I, I can't, I can't think of a time, but things have changed, right? Things have changed, but guess what? God's word does not change. So again, let's go to the next who wears the pants, right? Who wears the pants? So we know what that phrase means. So that means individuals um, basically exercising, controlling authority in the household. So when you see a woman, you know, um, kind of taking leadership roles and she's bossing around and pushing around the husband, very vocal, very loud, uh, brash, <laughs> right? You would say, oh, we can tell who wears the pants in that family. Where did that phrase come from? because pants were not female garments. Pants are men's garments, right? Women should not be wearing pants, right? Without a long covering over them. We'll get to that later. All right, let's, let's read this. So it says that pants are not only men's garments, but they are also immodest. Why? Again, I saw that God's order has been reversed. Let's jump to that last yellow statement. It is immodest apparel wholly unfitted. It's immodest. Why is it immodest? Look at the picture there. You can see, you don't need me to tell you why it's immodest. You can see the leg, right? The form of the leg. All right. So these are so-called modest pants. I don't care how loose fitting they are. They are a man's garment and they're still not modest. You can still see the shape of the woman, no matter how loose the pants are. These are some other so-called modest pants, not modest, not feminine, not a woman's garment. Again, all right. So now look at this statement here. And and I'm sure you can even attest to this with the so-called dress reform. This is the counterfeit dress reform, the American costume. There goes a spirit of levity and boldness just in keeping with the dress. Modesty and reserve seem to depart from many as they adopt that style of dress. Would you believe that that picture is a picture of four women? You have to really, really look closely to see that those are women. But look how they're dressed. Look how they're sitting. Right. You would think that they're it's men there. And maybe that's the look. That's probably the look that they're going for. It says here, modesty and reserve seem to depart from many as they adopt that style of dress. I was shown that God would have us take a course consistent and explainable. Let the sisters adopt the American costume. Let them start dressing like a man. Man. Let them start wearing pants and look what the result would be. They would destroy their own influence and that of their husbands. They would become a byword and a derision. So not only would they be wearing that which God calls an abomination, but they would bring a reproach, a shame to their husband. They would be considered a byword and a derision and they would lose their influence, lose their influence. Solemn. It's, it's very serious. Take this to the Lord in prayer if this is your struggle. He will help you right now in times past. Like I said, it wasn't always socially acceptable for women to wear pants. But again, pants wearing was an identifier of those who were lesbians. 
Do you want to be associated as that? Do you? Well, wear the pants and maybe individuals will see you that way. You can pause the screen and you can read this. This is just a little bit of history. I'll read the yellow part. I'm not going to take the time to read all of this. But at a time when it was socially unacceptable, they had to kind of go underground, but they would send codes to each other. So they would cut their hair a certain way. They would put on certain garments and, oh, okay. So they can identify one another. And one of those articles of clothing was pants. So it says in the 1920s, when women began dressing more masculinely, many queer women adopted styles with trousers. Though not everyone in the community used this signal, wearing trousers in public was a nod to being a lesbian. Again, do you want to be associated as a lesbian or do you want to be associated as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, right? As a, a modest, godly woman. I don't want to be falsely associated, right? And so... Brothers and sisters, again, this is something that we have to take to God in prayer. Now, the Bible calls dressing, cross-dressing, men dressing as women, women dressing as men, as an abomination. He also calls um, man with man, lying with mankind, and vice versa, women lying with womankind. He calls that an abomination as well. He also says that those that are effeminate in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, that they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So would the reverse be true? So those individuals, those men that are dressing in drag and cross-dressing and wearing skirts and dresses and all these sorts of things, um, that that is abominable. What about those that are wearing men's garment? The same, the Bible is consistent. The same holds true. Is that right? So let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. Is there ever a time when women should wear uh, trousers or something to cover, cover their legs? Because we have winter time, right? So are we saying you just wear a skirt and nothing over to cl clothe your legs? No. Dress reform is health reform. The extremities have to be covered. All right? So, but we would wear the leggings, the stockings, the what have you. We would wear them as undergarments. Okay? So I have a visual here. Okay, you can wear these as undergarments. But what we find today is that individuals now, male and female, and it is very immodest, and this is something that is very just disgusting. It's all over the place. You see people walking with undergarments that are just out, you know, without a covering over them. So, yes, in the wintertime, when you're working, when you're gardening, women, you should uh, cover your extremities. Okay, you can put long johns on or what have you but never without a long skirt or dress. And why do I say that? Because remember, the American costume, there were slacks and trousers under that short jacket or that short dress or skirt. That was still considered immodest. So you shouldn't be able to see the majority of, of your leggings like that. You should cover it with a long skirt, especially skirt or dress, especially in the winter time. Okay? And... Just based on that last statement there about the spirit of levity accompanying this style of dress, that's very true. Because when people are dressed in pants or slacks, a lot of times they are not cautious with how they sit. So they, ladies, I'm talking. So they're sitting with their legs open. They're, they're just, you know, and it said a spirit of boldness comes with it, right? God have, has called us to be submissive to our husbands, right? God has called us to be, to have a meek and quiet spirit. But along with this masculine dressing, some type of spirit takes over, you know, where now you're l loud and boisterous and you're very bold and just, um, you know, you lose all of the feminine qualities. And so it is a matter of salvation. It is something that we should take to God in prayer. And it's something that um, we need to consider as it relates to um, what sermon we're preaching. Are we adopting Satan's counterfeit dress reform? Or are we accepting God's dress reform, God's change of raiment that he paid his life to give us, right? So now, I don't think I have this on the screen, but there's a statement that I want you to, want you to write down from volume, volume, four, volume 1, page 460. And it says this, God designed that there should be a plain distinction in the dress of men and women. Okay, it is on the screen. Praise the Lord, a plain distinction. 
all right, between the dress of men and women and has considered the matter of sufficient importance to give explicit directions in regard to it. For the same dress worn by both sexes would cause confusion and great increase of crime. Were the apostle Paul alive and should he behold women professing godliness with this style of dress, he would utter a rebuke. So unisex dressing should not be, right? And it says that great confusion would ensue. Do we see great confusion? Absolutely. Again, we see college educated people that are asked, what is a woman? They cannot tell you what a woman is. A two year old child, a three year old child can tell you what a woman is. You, great confusion. You have men thinking they're women, women thinking they're men taking hormones. You have even children taking hormones. Great confusion and crime has increased. Pedophilia has increased. All kind of confusion, people mutilating their bodies, people doing all sorts of things. And it stems back to the cross dressing. Brothers and sisters, this is a serious thing. This is something that we all need to consider. And so I would like to leave you with, please read chapter 83. It's called of Testimonies for the Church, volume one. It's called Reform and Dress. It goes into the American costume. It goes into all of that. The cross dressing, the unisex dressing, men dress, women dressing as men, etc. And you know what I find very sad in closing, I'm gonna end on a, a very solemn note, one for you to take in prayer, that after hearing this, after reading the statements, seeing the statements on the screen, a lot of individuals will say, they'll find some excuse. You know, well, my job requires me to dress this way, so there's nothing I can do. Well, maybe that's not the job for you, right? Um, I, I have to exercise every day. Guess what? If women were able to do it in the 18, uh, 1800s, the early 1900s, they were able to horseback ride, garden, exercise, do their housework, do their chores in modest clothing and dresses, you're able to do it too. As a matter of fact, today I played, did simple ball playing with my children. In my dress reform, my long dress, I had no impede, I was not impeded in my movement at all. I was able to run today in dress reform. So it, it's not a hindrance. It's really a blessing for us if we would only obey. Don't be like those seven women in Isaiah chapter four that say, we will eat our own bread, right? We will wear our own apparel. Just let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Guess what? If you're going to go against God's principles of dress reform, again, you're going to be a derision. You are going to be a reproach and a byword. So please do not be like this. Take these counsels to the Lord in prayer. Get the book, Thy Nakedness. Read chapter 83 of Testimonies for the Church, volume one. Go on your knees, pray to God, and he will provide the change of raiment for you, just like he provided the change of raiment for Adam and Eve. All right, so I leave it there. Next week, we will be back by God's grace, and we will be dealing with another important topic. We will be dealing with dress reform from the health perspective. Until then, God bless. Take care. Maranatha.